1333, okay? So that's how they, those rocks are built. And they tell us, the geologists tell us, this one here and the other one over the back are actually getting taller. Not that they're getting taller, the surrounding plains are getting lower. So does that sort of make sense? It's not quickly.
hand in, you'll actually see a circle. So during initiation, this is where the boys came, the caves that they came into. And they were made to stay here until they were being taught things. And then they'd be taken from here by the men out to do their hunting or whatever they needed to learn. And uh, this was the cave that they'd done most of their uh, initiation, the early parts of their initiation. And uh, as normally around puberty, so around 13, 14, that sort of age group. 15, something in that range. So. If you have a look at the cave itself, look up above, you can actually see where it slipped off the uh, side and slipped down. Okay, we'll make a move round to the breakfast. <laughs> So this is probably a good place to uh, look at a bit of the bush food here that we can see. Up on the rock is the eely, the uh, rock pig. A little wee uh, berry about so big, um, normally an orangey colour. Um, Semi-sweet, I guess you'd call him. Um, there is quite a bit of it in, or a big bush in or against desert gardens. If you walk up there you might find some white fruit you can try. Uh, out here, you're not allowed to try any of that. Okay. The bush plum is that line of green trees that are sitting below the rock there. Okay. That's the one you showed us before. That's the one I showed you before. Very good. Okay. So this dead finish bush in front of us is a pretty unique plant. Very quickly, normally finches live in there. Okay. When the finches do their droppings, the Ananu pick it up, put it with a little bit of water and put it on their temples to reduce headaches, okay? How you learnt that one, I don't know. And I haven't tried it out, okay? The spikes on it, they actually put underneath warts, and over a couple of days, it'll actually lift the wart out. The wart will die. So, the it's called the Den Finnish Bush, mainly for the Europeans. Do you want to move over this way a bit? Bit, um, bit The early settlers out here, the early settlers out here, when they were on their properties and there was a big drought and they have been going for quite some time, the last bush to have greenery on it is normally the dead finish bush. The animals eat it, it's very spiky, it perforates the inside of their stomach and the infection sets up and they actually die. So that's where the Europeans see the dead finish bush, but to the Ananu it has a couple of good things. One of them is it's a good house for the finches and uh, the finches or the little birds are actually protected in there from lizards and snakes and that sort of thing and uh, they can actually get the eggs out of there if they want. Another very important tree is this one just here, the bloodwood tree. It has all three. It's hardwood, um, similar to the mulga, very dense and very tough. The women, does everyone know about pity bowls, what pity bowl looks like? No? Okay, I'll pull some artwork out in a moment and show you uh, when we get back to the bus. So the, they would cut a piece of the bark out and then they'd shape it like a bowl, so it was sort of a cup shape like that. That would carry everything from babies to seed to whatever the women needed to carry. It was a woman's implement and that, that was the tree that it was taken out of. The, uh, the medicine is actually that blood red uh, sap that you see there. The Ananu found out that you could actually grind it up with a little bit of water put it on a saw and it actually healed the saw and it was also a disinfectant. So it was a unique product that way. They also found that we have what they call sandy blight out here and it's where your body dehydrates, your eyelids turn in on your eyes and scratch your eyes and you go mm. blind. The Ananu worked out that they could actually use that early enough, that uh, blood uh, sap, and spray it in your eyes and it would actually help to retain your eyesight. Okay. So that's those two, and the fruit, we don't have any other trees around here. It's what they call a bush coconut, normally anywhere from about that size to about that size, okay. Inside is a little white grub, protein, similar to the witchy grub. They eat it, 
and uh, it's high in protein. The actual pith or the white, what looks like a coconut um, filling, they actually eat that as well. So it has uh, a couple of things. Just looks like your coconut once you take the grub out of it that you get, an outside layer. It actually grows because of an insect that pierces the bark, and the bark actually grows around it to protect the insect. Mm. The insect eats its way and fills up and gets bigger on the inside, and uh, it becomes the grub, the protein that they eat, but once it hatches, it actually becomes more um, uh, young and that toe form. What's happening is as the heat gets underneath it and a bit of erosion, eventually they'll move enough that they'll be able to fall down. Similar to what's happened over here on the left hand side. See how it slips sideways over there? You can see the clean part of the rock. Mm. Now just to the left of those, there's two trees there. The first one on this side is a desert oak. The one on the other side is the bloodwood. Okay. In the Lunkata, in the uh, Kunyaliru story, those two trees are pointed to by the Ananu as the one on this side, Liru warrior, and the one on the other side is Kunya's nephew being taken around to the waterhole. So I'll explain a little bit more about it as we go along, but that's the trees to the Chukaricha to the children. Okay, the second story I can tell you about is about Lunkata. Lunkata is a little wee fat slow, old, blue tongue lizard man. And he comes from out Katajuda way. As he's coming across the country, he stopped at the waterhole overnight, and then he moved on towards the rock today in the morning. When he arrived, he went up into these caves up the top up here, and made himself a bit of a home. When he did, he was getting a bit hungry, so he decided to come down and go hunting. He moved around to the south side of the rock. As he was going around looking his food, he's seen the tracks of a galea or an emu dragging a spear along in the dirt. So he followed it, knowing full well that it was wrong. The person who owns that spear actually owns that bird. That's his bird. So as he's going along, he's getting hungrier and he can see the galea a bit in front of him. He decides, no, nah, I'm going to have it. So he did. He pulls up, hits it on the head, starts to break it up. And he can hear something coming in the distance and he knew those hunters had the bird and they tracked it to where he killed it. He knew that he'd be in trouble, so he hit the bird behind him. And as the boys come over the hill, they were the Pampan Bellbirds, two crested bellbirds. These boys were known to be very good hunters and they'd been hunting this emu. So in the old days, when they hunted an emu, they speared it and allowed it to walk off and they just followed it until it got weak enough that they could catch it and then they would kill it. They would never use any extra energy to run it down, okay? Everything's about conserving energy and so as you can live to, to fight another day. So as they came over the hill they called out to Lunkata sitting over there. Lunkata, have you seen our emu? He's dragging a spear. Lunkata said, no, no I haven't seen it. And they said, Lunkata, are you sure? No, no, I haven't seen it. Perhaps if you go south, you might see it around the other side of the rock. The boys, very disappointed, headed around, tracked it for a little while, and then all of a sudden, Lunkata's tracks come in from the side, and they realised he tricked them. So they followed it until where they thought perhaps they'd made a mistake, but no, they're where Lunkata's tracks finished, so did the Indians, and they'd gone back. So with that, they went back to where Lunkata had been sitting, breaking up the meat and no sign of him. Lunkata had run back to his cave. 
as he'd been running, he picked up all the meat he could carry, and he was dropping the odd bit and piece along the way. So the Pempan Parlour brothers had no trouble in following him. When they got here and looked up, they knew where he would be, so they called out to him. Lunkata, throw us down our emu. We know you have our emu. Not a word. Lunkata hid at the back of the cave. Never said anything. So they looked up again and still no sign, so he called out again. Lunkata, throw down our emu. We know you have it. No sound again. So they thought, yeah, well, we'll make a big fire here. So they make a big fire here at the bottom and they light it up. And as it heats up the rock and runs up the side, the smoke billows into that cave up there. Well, Carter, running short of breath, came to the edge of the cave, not being able to see because of the smoke, he tripped and fell. And if you look at that green lichen coming down, that's the chuka to the children of Long Carter's skin and meat being peeled off as he rolled down on the bottom. And they actually point to a little rock in here, and that's what left of Long Carter to that. So if we look at that story, we can see quite a few different morals in it. Can anyone tell me one of them? Not to steal. Very good. There, that's one. Any not, others? Not to lie. Not to lie. That's another one. The one about whose ever bird it is that belongs to that person, not to you, that stole it. Okay. So there's three of the lessons. And the other lesson is, how do you get a, a uh, lizard out of a hole? Mm -hmm. so, okay, because yeah. if you've got a brown snake in the hole and you're smoking him out and he comes out, better to come out than put your hand in there and get bitten. So, mm -hmm. so smoke a lizard out, okay? So that's what the children would learn off that. But as adults, we think a little bit further out. Let's think about when he travelled across country. He stopped at a water hole overnight. Why did he do that? To reef and hydrate. to always carry water and be near water. So that was one of the lessons they learned. Another lesson they might have learned was if you fall off the rock, there's a fair chance you're going to die. Okay? So to understand the story, does that give you an idea of how the next story gives you a little bit more of the information? And then the next story gives you a little bit more? So everything is about learning. So is anyone a wine drinker? Yes. Yes. Yes? Yes. Can you see the glass of red wine up in the back? <laughs> yeah. Can see it? See the wine glass up in the back? The red wine yeah. glass? So what I want to point out to you is have a look around the rock and see what other images you can see. We're going to come shortly upon a dog that you can see in the rock. Okay? When someone sees it, tell me. There's an animal upside down like Yeah. 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 Okay. No one's pointed that one out to me. So remember that the Ananu have been looking at this rock for 35,000 years, and all the stories they have will relate to something on the rock that they've seen, something that they can talk about. So as their children have an understanding that it's true what they're telling them. To understand the elders, they never ever told lies, because life was too precious. Out here. If I told you a lie that that plant over there was okay to eat and you're going to yeah. die, you needed to know that you were going to die, not that you were fooling you. Yeah. Same as uh, European people, I know I give my children help and tell them stories that are half true and you see whether they can work out which is true and which is not. Okay. The Ananu never ever did because life was too precious to them. So much so that where I worked in Western Australia, the boys wouldn't come into work one day and you'd say to them a couple of days later, you didn't turn up for work, why? Oh, boss, too much to drink, couldn't get out of bed. But they would always tell you the yeah, truth. truth. Yeah. Okay? How many Europeans would tell you? <laughs> Diarrhea, pain yeah. in the stomach, yeah, severe migraine. <laughs> we all know what they are, aren't they? Yeah, yeah bad night on the grog. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll move okay. off. It's a very sticky seed. It sticks to their behind, they can't get it off. So they've got to scrape their bottom on a branch. When they do, the seed comes off on the branch mm. and that branch becomes the host for that plant. Now the, um, 
uh, mistletoe. Actually, the seed of it they used as a um, appetite suppressor. Okay, I'm not sure how they worked it out, but that's one of the ones that they use. Okay, okay, we'll move on. Bird droppings. Oh, I see. Okay, so you see how the cracks up here have got bird droppings in them? Uh -huh. Okay, that's water running through from up further mm. down behind the rock. So there's a lot of cracks through the surface of the rock, and that's where those bird droppings are coming out. Okay, you see the crack up here? Mm -hmm. Where the eely, the uh, fig is? Yeah. That goes down here. And it goes around the other side of the rock. I'll point it out on the other side. That piece is just sitting there quite happily at this point in time. There's a crack all the way through. <laughs> the warriors or the uh, people hunting would be out here in the bush. Once they hunted an animal, the boys, it was their job to track it. So they turned, they learnt first hand. There'd be two or three boys just following along, following the tracks and understanding how it changes over country and that's the way they learn. you've actually read lately, if you like me, you haven't read any for a long while, and think about the front cover that you've actually seen on the book. How much did that front cover actually tell you about the story that was inside? Very little? Okay, so the artwork is exactly the same. Because we weren't here when the stories were delivered, we can't actually tell you what they're all about. Okay, so now that I've got those out, I'll point out a couple of things to you while I've got the opportunity before someone wants to get in. See these seven concentric circles through here? Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll talk to about that one because that gives you an idea of how little we know about it. Concentric circles mean meeting places, water holes, or places of significance, okay? The seven water holes around the rock. Someone could have been talking about the seven water holes explaining their significance to the children. It could have also been a path from here over to um, Katajuta, telling them where the water holes were, where the best food were. By drawing the circles, they would know where to go. They could come back and look at the circles and remember what Grandpa told them. They would know how to get across there. It could also be Cornu's necklace, okay, when she came across country. It could also be the Seven Sisters, the star constellation. Does everyone know the Seven Sisters? No? Pallades, the Greek mythology. Very similar story to what is here. And the story here is that the Seven Sisters in the sky, it's a constellation that uh, sits near um, Orion. Everyone know Orion in the sky? Okay. So the Seven Sisters wanted to come down to Earth to play and they wanted to come down and meet some new people. The gods in the sky said, yes, you could come down between dawn and dusk but you had to be back in the sky or you remained on earth forever. So the ladies come down, they met up with seven gentlemen out here and they had a good day playing around. When it came time to leave, just on dusk, six of them bolted back into the sky. The seventh one, the youngest one, was trying to be conned by old Wati Liru, uh, Malawati, the uh, old gentleman, to stay here on earth and be his wife. He's trying to con her, but if you look at the constellation today, 
up there. There's six in one cluster, and there's one a little bit behind. This is the story of how they explain that one sitting behind. And the uh, Orion's belt, or Orion up in the sky, they talk to us about that being Malawati, the old man chasing the girls, okay? So they understood the stars very well. They've had 35,000 year, years to study them. They also, there's in the Milky Way, there's a, a dark shadow in there that looks like an emu. When that emu turns to a certain position in the sky, they know they can go and collect the emu eggs because that is the time the emu eggs arrive, okay? So they understand the sky very well. So much so that a lot of times they can talk about their ancestry. So-and-so up here is looking after you and they use that as like their blanket. Their ancestors are looking down over them so they don't mind sleeping out in country. Some say that when they sleep in here, if you have a look through here, see those lines through there, the yeah. splatters? Yeah. Some say that that's the splatters of the stars and they could actually sleep under here because they had the stars up above them. Hmm. The black on the roof, any guesses? Fire. Yeah, fire. So the smoke from sitting under here telling the stories. Okay, so this fella here, it is actually the uh, honey grevillea. So the honey grevillea, as I said earlier, was a part of their sugar diet, a part of their sugar. And uh, I explained to you before about diabetes and obesity. There was you as I explained it to, not one of the groups yesterday. <laughs> okay, did I or not? No. No? no? Okay. Because they had somewhere between a tablespoon and two tablespoons of sugar in their diet a year, you go back to the 1930s, that was the first time that Europeans had consistent um, uh, contact with the Arnhemu out here. So that was the first time that they really got into contact with sugar and flour, the refined foods that we have today. Now, if you look at our bodies, they don't survive real well on sugar and flour. We have obesity and we have diabetes. The Arnhemu have it far worse because their bodies have had even less time to adapt to it. So to understand that their diet was very, very acidic in comparison to ours, you can understand why those yearly that we were talking about before and um, that why they're bitter to us, but to the Ananu they're quite sweet, quite a nice fruit, okay? So that gives you a little bit of an idea of how the sugar and how little sugar they had. Some of the sugar that they did have was in that form of a jala ant. Let's find out. So that's the jala ant, okay? So all these years an ant with a little wee abdomen of um, nectar on the back. I'm going to pass it around. And the, the witchy grubs on the other side. So what that uh, ant was used for was traditionally for supplying the uh, workers with food when a drought was on, okay? So that bulb on the back end was a sugary nectar that would keep the ants alive. The Ananu children learnt that that wasn't too bad to eat either. About seven to eight feet underneath a, a, a witchy bush or a, a mulga bush is where you'll find those. It's a women's job to dig down and get them and uh, it's a fair bit of work for a wee bit of sugar. Okay? So that's how little sugar was in their diet. So, well, we've got no one out there. Kunya? Okay. And Leary? So that water hole where we were standing a few minutes ago, that's what it can look like. Okay. And that's a picture from on top of the rock where the old runway was. Okay. So remember the pity bowl we were talking about? That's a pity bowl there. Okay. All as it is is a bowl like that, shaped and held, and uh, the women would put all they wanted to carry in it. Anything from babies to seed to whatever they needed to move across country. This head ring here was normally made out of hair and out of soft grasses, and they put that on their head, put the pity bowl on their head, mm. and off they would go. The stone in the middle is the one that they used to uh, give away to family members. That's the one that they used. And that's a wana, a digging stick that fella in there. So that's what the women, when they headed across country, would actually carry with them. The men would carry a number seven boomerang. Remember us talking about the number seven boomerang? They'd also carry a club. They would carry spears. 
uh, clubs for hitting and the miru, um, which is a throwing stick that they use, that what they use to propel a spear. Okay, so that's what the men would head off with, and that's all they ever travelled with. It was very very lightly, um, and that's some of the foods on the back. Okay. So that's your bush coconut. Okay. It's a bush coconut. How long does it take to grow like this? Size? Mm -hmm. the, uh, the biggest I've seen is about, perhaps about that. Right. Big. Okay. I don't know. Um, I know that they're supposed to be very tasty. I've never eaten one, but I've heard they're very tasty. We've got someone coming in, so I'll make the rest of it. Uh, this here, they talk about the mamu as a um, ghost, a kopan, okay? Whether it is or not, I don't know. The sea, we were talking about before, yeah. up in the rock, okay? That one, you can't tell what it is. A sea, if you're looking at artwork anywhere, will either have a boomerang and a spear beside it, or a um, pity bowl and a, wa a wana, a digging stick. The wana and the digging stick are the women, the spear and the boomerang is the men. Okay, so if you're looking at artwork, that's how you tell the difference. Okay, um, this one up here. Any guesses? And there's another one over there. Any sun? guesses as to what it might be? The worm. The worm? No, not the witch in the Yes. The sun coming up? No, no. no. It's actually the modesty belt for the young people oh. when they're going through uh, puberty. Okay, so they didn't use very much, I would say. Over here, we actually have boomerangs. But if you have a look at them, they're the returning boomerangs from up north, mm. up in northern Australia. So to understand that those have been brought there, you've got to realise that they've actually travelled across the country. Well, the stories have to get across here, OK? So this one that's up above me, this fella here, it's the only one I can tell you with any certainty. Well, I haven't got a real lot of certainty on it either. <laughs> the gentleman today is in his 90s. It was drawn for him by his grandfather, or by his father, when he was a boy. Now, understanding age in the older Ananu is very hard, because they never understood years, dates. All as they ever knew was one, two, three, Juta. Juta meant many. So they knew that they were born when this was hot, or when it was cold, or when it was windy, or whatever season that was. But they didn't know how many seasons had gone past. Once there were three gone past, they didn't need to know. All that they needed to know was that they could survive. They could get their next lot of food to actually go on to live. And until you got to the stage where you couldn't get your next food, you were very useful to the community. After that, I've heard some different stories, but yeah, none of them sound very pleasant as to how they get rid of their old people. So we won't worry about that part. And to understand this country, they needed to do that. And what I've told you today, I hope it's given you an appreciation of how they actually understood the country. Yeah. That one, as I said, is about 80, 70 to 80 years old. We don't actually know exactly how long, but here's the last one that was drawn in. The rest we can't tell. Because they're ochre and um, made out of water and a stone, or uh, yeah, stone, they can't actually carbon date it because there's nothing there to carbon date. Does that make sense? So they can't actually tell us how old the rest of the artwork is. If you have a look at this one here, have a look. If you look at the bottom of the cave here, what do you notice? Absentee of artwork. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go back to uh, the early European uh, guides that come in here. Mm -hmm. There used to be a bucket of water sit here, and what they would do is they throw it over the artwork. Why? Black and white photos, the artwork would actually stand out better. But mix water and ochre, and what happens? Oh, what you've got on the bottom, nothing. It disappears. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we're going to have to walk out. Just a question: What's these boats here? They're actually the uh, swallows or the uh, martins. Okay. They're a little bird. Yeah. Um, they build their nest. They knock them down. See how this one's got a hole here? Yeah. Yeah. And see. Yeah. Thank you. Now. I assume that they've knocked the back end out of that. Yeah, they have. Right? So what they do is they come in here, they make their eggs in yeah. there, and they're quite safe from the predators outside. 
You will see them floating around up in the sky. Does everyone know swallows? Yeah. 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 Okay. I think they're a pretty common bird all over the world. So yeah, that's what we've got out here: swallows or martins, and uh, they're what makes. And a lot of that uh, white on the rock is from those yeah. birds where they nest. long slit that comes down here. It's the actual spear into the thigh of the emu bird that um, the uh, long carter was hunting. So that's the chukka reacher to the children that the part of the story is true. That's the spear being dragged along by the emu's thigh. Okay? <laughs> 